Well, welcome everyone to this online special online lecture series for Heritage Theological Seminary. Um, it is my privilege to be the first one in the line to go. Uh, my name is Dr. Ian Valancourt. I serve as Associate Professor of Old Testament and Hebrew at Heritage, and I'm also the Director of Distance Learning. Um, I'm an ordained pastor in the Fellowship of Evangelical Baptists in Canada. I served for 14 years in senior and teaching pastoral roles before, you know, along the way I did the PhD and, and then came on to Heritage um, as a, a Old Testament and Hebrew professor. It's just been a privilege and a joy to serve um, in this role. Before we get started, I thought I would just kind of flag something. You guys are all online, so that means you're tech savvy, or at least tech savvy enough to get online for a lecture. And I thought I'd mention that uh, a new degree program at Heritage, the Master of Theological Studies Online, I'm just going to take 30 seconds and, and tell you about it, okay? The Master of Theological Studies Online, it's a fully online master's degree, and it's fully accredited with the Association of Theological Schools, so it's a fully accredited, fully online degree. We really think it's God's gracious providence at Heritage that it's ready to go now. We've been working on it for years. Our faculty have been recording for a couple of years now in order to get everything ready and online. And here it is launching at a time in world history where online education is a real blessing. Uh, four words we use to describe our degree, comprehensive, Christ-centered, interactive, and flexible. Comprehensive, Christ-centered, interactive, and flexible. And so for more information on it, you can go admissions at heritagecs.edu and uh, admissions at heritagecs for college and seminary.edu and you can get more information on it. I just thought I'd mention it though. We'd love to uh, see you inquire more. Okay, for this lecture today, um, I am going to right now deliver my lecture. And this is the kind of thing that I say in the classroom in a first year Old Testament introduction and theology course. So in my first year course, I tend to, um, this is, this is a, a portion of one of my lectures. So this will give you a bit of a taste for a seminary. Um, I encourage you to get your Bibles out if you have them handy. I'm gonna read different passages from the English Standard Version. And whether you have a Bible on your screen or whether you have a hard copy handy, I'm going to read from the ESV. You can follow along in whichever version you have handy. Also note that there's a question and answer feature for this lecture. So you can type your questions during my lecturing. And then after my lecture is over, I'm going to click on the Q&A tab. And um, I'm, going to, I'm going to click on the Q&A tab and um, I'm going to uh, yeah. seek to answer some of those, okay? All right, so let me pray for us, and um, I'm going to pray for us and then get started. I just got a note that it's a little bit too loud, so I'm going to let my tech people either handle that or tell me to do something, okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of in the even in this lockdown time that you've blessed us um, with technology that we can dig in your word like this together i pray that you would send your holy spirit and guide us in truth i thank you for the blessing of the spirit i pray i thank you for the blessing of um your word and i pray that you would through this time equip us to handle your word better I pray you'd ultimately be pointing us to Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Um, well, David Goliath and the gospel. Uh, the David and Goliath story from 1 Samuel 17 is one of the most loved stories from the Bible. My kids love it. Adults love it too. You know, who doesn't love a story of a, of a little young guy with a, with a slingshot killing a big warrior, right? Um, most of the time today, when people apply this story, they apply it as a sort of motivator for Christians about how to face their giants. Something like this. Just like David faced the giant in his life with God's help, so you can face the giant obstacles in your life with God's help. Now that sounds appealing, but I'm going to surprise you maybe and say 
that this is not first and foremost a story about you facing your giants. In the end, the application, Lord willing, will be strengthening to you as a Christian, and it'll equip you to face difficulties and challenges, but it will be in a way that is better than a motivational speech about you being courageous to be able to face your giants head on and with kind of God as the Oscar nominee for best supporting actor in your endeavors, kind of with God's help. So as we look at the David and Goliath story in light of the larger biblical story, we're gonna be pointed first to the gospel. In other words, the primary reason God ordered and recorded these events was in order to prepare God's Old Testament people to anticipate the coming of Jesus. As we today fill our minds with this chapter of scripture, we are led to powerful, life-transforming gospel application. So if we're gonna gain the full gospel benefit of this story, we need to understand it in the context of the larger biblical story. So the first part of this lecture, we're gonna look at some key highlights of the Bible story that will help us interpret the story of David and Goliath. Next, we're gonna zoom in and notice some of the key features of the story of David and Goliath from 1 Samuel 17. Then we're gonna compare the great victory of David to the greater victory of Jesus. And finally, at the end, we're gonna consider what it looks like to live in light of our Savior's victory. So that's kind of our where we're headed here. Um, let's begin first with what I call the story so far. Our first point is the story so far. The story of David and Goliath is recorded in 1 Samuel 17. So here I've got my ESV thin line Bible. And as I turn to 1 Samuel 17, I find that it is on page 239. Now, in my ESV thin line Bible, if I turn to the very back to the book of Revelation before the concordance, but to the book of Revelation, and I find the very last verse of the very last chapter of Revelation, it's on page 1042. So in other words, that gives us a bit of an idea that um, about a quarter of the Bible's story has already happened this much by the time we get to the David and Goliath story. By the time we get to the David and Goliath story, the story of God's plan of redemption recorded in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, and the first part of 1 Samuel has already been told, okay? Some of you are thinking, I forgot, Ruth. I didn't, it's a, it's a long story. It's about the Hebrew order. Anyway, um, so if we're gonna understand the story of David and Goliath correctly, we need to remember some key highlights of the story so far. And we're gonna kind of do like a 30,000 foot bird's eye view, plane's eye view of this, of what's what's gone on already that'll help equip us to understand this David and Goliath story better. So we need to remember first that God, God's perfect creation. God created, God created the world perfect. He created a man and woman as the crowning climax of his creation. And in Genesis 3, we remember the fall into sin, okay? We also need to remember the first glimmer of gospel hope after the fall into sin. So before God spoke words of punishment to the man and the woman, in Genesis 3.15, we read this. God says this to the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring or seed and her offspring or seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now we could say a lot about this verse. This is, uh, th theologians through history have referred to this as the proto-gospel. Um, you know, the first glimmer of gospel hope in the entire Bible. And, but what we're gonna, say for our purposes just now is from this point forward in the biblical story from genesis 3 15 onward we as readers are looking forward to one who would be born in the lineage of eve and who would win the ultimate victory over sin satan death and hell for us okay as the bible storyline continues the identity of this coming savior continues to emerge. So more and more light is shed on his identity and his mission as the Bible's story is told. 
So at Heritage Seminary, Dr. Hausen at the seminary teaches an entire course called Biblical Theology, and he spends three hours a week for 12 weeks going into detail, tracing the Bible story from Genesis to Revelation. So for our purposes in this lecture on David and Goliath, we can notice just a few more key verses, a few more key features of the first quarter of our Bibles that are really important to recognize as we interpret 1 Samuel 17. The first is Genesis 3.15. The next one, if you've got your Bibles, is Genesis 49, verse 10. Genesis 49, verse 10. In the context of this verse, Jacob is blessing his 12 sons. We read this. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Now, this is not just a generic promise that the lineage of Judah would continue or be blessed. This verse is saying Judah's lineage will be special. It's going to be the lineage of blessing leading to the ultimate seed of the woman from Genesis 3.15. Okay, and it's also giving us more information about the kind of savior this person would be. He's going to hold a scepter, a ruler's staff, tribute's going to come to him, and the peoples will obey him. What kind of person is this? He's a king. He's a king. So in summary, Genesis has taught us that we got ourselves into a horrible mess, Genesis 3, but God is going to do something about it, Genesis 3.15, and that that something will be accomplished through a coming king, Genesis 49, verse 10. As the story of the Bible continues to build then, every time a baby is born, we are left asking, if he could be the promised royal savior, okay? Every time a miraculous birth of a child happens in Genesis, we are asking, is this the promised royal savior? One such miraculous birth is recorded at the very beginning of the story of First Samuel. The mom's name was Hannah. The baby was named Samuel, and that does it for us. You know, if we're readers and it's our first time ever reading this book, my goodness, the book's named after him. And if his birth was a clear miracle, he must be the hero of the story of 1 Samuel and maybe even the grand story of the Bible as a whole. But in Hannah's song, she sings a praise song to Yahweh in light of the birth of her child in 1 Samuel 2. So I encourage you to turn in your Bible to 1 Samuel 2. We learn in Hannah's song that the birth of this child will bring salvation for God's people in a very specific way. In 1 Samuel 2 verse 10, Hannah concluded her song by exulting in Yahweh, quote, who will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Okay, he's going to give Yahweh's going to give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. What's going on here? Well, in the story that follows, Samuel grew up and became a priest and a prophet. But according to 1 Samuel 2:10, the real hero of 1 Samuel is going to be a king. Doesn't this remind us of God's promise of a royal descendant of Judah? Genesis 49:10. So just like my glasses here help me see the world more clearly, you, um, you know, my screen just went blurry. Um, now I can see a lot more clearly. As we read 1 Samuel, we find that this verse, 1 Samuel 2 verse 10, about a coming king who will be anointed by Yahweh and strengthened by him to work mightily, that verse is the lens through which we need to read the rest of 1 and 2 Samuel. Okay? By the way, um, I often talk about the book of Samuel um, or the books of Samuel. The, the reason we have first and second Samuel or first and second Kings or first and second Chronicles is scroll length, okay? A scroll couldn't support all the content in first and second Samuel. So they made two scrolls out of it. And just over time, it kind of became two books, but it's actually one story. In fact, Samuel and Kings is one story. But anyway, as we do this, as we read 
the book First and Second Samuel through the lens of First Samuel 2, verse 10, and in light of Samuel becoming a prophet and a priest, but not a king, we find that Samuel, this miraculously born baby, is going to be nominated for the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor in our story. And his main role will be to prepare the way for the real hero of the story. As we read 1 Samuel, we are to be looking for this king, expecting he will be anointed by Yahweh for his devoted service and strengthened by Yahweh to defeat those who oppose him. Samuel's going to be great, and he'll even probably win that coveted Oscar as Best Supporting Actor, but the focus of his ministry will be to prepare the way for the coming king. Okay, so by the time we get about halfway through the book of 1 Samuel, Saul has already been appointed as king. Um, he's also proved to be not God's man. So after Yahweh definitively rejected Saul as king in 1 Samuel 15, Yahweh then sent Samuel to the house of Jesse to anoint one of his sons as his chosen king in 1 Samuel 16. And unlike Saul, Saul was from the lineage of Benjamin. David was from the lineage of Judah. This means he's in the lineage of J Yahweh's chosen kings promised in Genesis 49.10. Isn't that hugely significant when we read this? See, if we're careful readers of the Bible, we know from the beginning, and there's other reasons too, that Saul ought not to be the real hero of the story, and we ought not to be surprised when he rejects Yahweh, that Yahweh rejects him, because he's from the tribe of Benjamin, his kingship, I didn't get into Deuteronomy 17, 14 to 20, and the, the picture of what kind of king um, should the Israel should put over themselves. Saul doesn't shape up. Okay, but here we have the youngest and smallest son of Jesse, and here David was at first overlooked because of that, but then he was chosen because Yahweh looks on the heart, 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. David was anointed as king by Samuel, but his official reign wasn't going to begin until the death of Saul. In the meantime, David entered into service for Saul as his personal musician and armor bearer, 1 Samuel 16, 14 to 23. All the while, though, we as readers may begin to think David could be the one promised in 1 first, uh, first Samuel 2, verse 10, the anointed king who will save God's people. Now, in light of these events, it's hugely significant that in the very next chapter of the Bible, after his anointing as king, 1 Samuel 17 will tell us about a great victory of a young King David and the, the impact of this victory on the people of Israel as a whole. Okay, so we've done the story so far. Let's second look at the story of David and Goliath, the story of David and Goliath second. So in light of this background, we can remember what happened here in 1 Samuel 17. I'm going to summarize it. Israel's in conflict with the Philistines, but that's common in that period of their history. The Philistines had a giant man and he was a great warrior. And every day he would come out and mock the Israelites. If one of you is able to fight and kill me, then we will be your servants. But God's people, Saul included, responded with fear and dismay. They were not willing to, to take up the challenge because all of them thought it would mean sure death for themselves. Now, this response by Saul is massively different from the judges in the previous book, right? The heroes from the book of Judges. Those men were mighty warriors who would have taken up this challenge, right? But not only is Saul a king who has been rejected by Yahweh because he's he has rejected Yahweh, 1 Samuel 15, and not only is he not in the right lineage to fulfill the promise to Judah in Genesis 49, verse 10, but he's also cowardly. In our scene here in 1 Samuel 17, David's brothers are fighting in the battle, but David's young and he's small. He's watching his dad's sheep and he would check in with the army on the battlefield once in a while. 
one day Jesse sent his youngest son, David, with some food for the older brothers. Take this food, feed your brothers, bring back a report to me about how your brothers are doing. You know, there's no Google News. There's no app for that. There's no texting. Um, news travels at the speed of a camel, right? And so, or feet. And so, David, I want you to go to the battlefield, feed your brothers and bring back word. How are things going? And now by this time, by the time David arrives on the battlefield, Goliath had been taunting Israel for 40 days. But when David arrived on the scene, this was the first time he heard the taunts. David's response comes at the end of verse 26. Look at it with me. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now that's the key. David's disgust is rooted in a concern for God's glory. The living God whose army we are will not be taunted by such a man. Brothers and sisters, it is appropriate to have a holy disgust for the taunting words of a sinner like this when he's taunting your God. David talked to his older brothers and to Saul, and everyone tried to talk him out of responding to the challenge of the Philistine, but David insisted he had killed lions and bears as a shepherd in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and he continues. Look at verse 37. And David said, Yahweh, who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and Yahweh be with you. So David tried to put on the armor. It's way too big for him. It's like someone my son's age trying to put on my hockey equipment. You know what I mean? Um, so he took his shepherd's staff. He took his five smooth stones and a sling, and he went out to face the giants like a little kid saying, okay, I'm going to go and play in the NHL, but I'm not going to wear equipment kind of thing going on. Now, Goliath had a shield bearer in front of him and armor for war on him. And this little shepherd boy approached him kind of, he's probably thinking, this kid has the personality of a poodle. Goliath looked at his shepherd's staff and asked him if he thought he was a dog because he came with sticks to play with him. Now look at verses 45 to 47. We have David's reply. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of Yahweh of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, Yahweh will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that Yahweh saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is Yahweh's, and he will give you into our hand. Well, first of all, notice the motivating factor for David. It's it's the glory of his God. He wants God's name to be known as great. They came at each other. David took his sling, released the stone, hit Goliath between the eyes, and the champion fell down dead. David walked up to him, removed, took Goliath's sword and cut off Goliath's head with his own sword. The Philistines fled and the army of Israel chased them and routed them in battle. And David, at the end of the chapter, caught Saul's attention as a warrior par excellence. Okay, so that's the story of David and Goliath in, the nut in a nutshell. Third we're gonna look at David, Goliath, and the gospel. So at the beginning of our time, I said it's common today to have as our first instinct to conclude something like this. Just as David faced the giant in his life and defeated him with God's help, so you and I can face the giants in our lives with God's help, whatever those giants may be. Maybe your giant is financial hardship and maybe your giant is a difficult relationship. Maybe it's an opposing sports team and maybe it's a broken down minivan. Maybe it's a terrifying health diagnosis, varying levels of giant there. But just like David had God's help and won the victory so you can live victorious, whatever your giant is. Okay, I would suggest to you that this first instinct is well-meaning but doesn't interpret the story 
in light of the larger biblical story. So as we read about the life of David, we need to notice that there are some ways he's just like us. So he needed to learn to trust Yahweh. He would later sin and need to turn from sin, Psalm 51. He, would, he even had to bear the earthly consequences for his own sins. You know, even as a forgiven yeah. sinner, sin has consequences. Um, 2 Samuel 12, verses 10 to 12. But as we read the life of David, we need to notice that he was also more than just like us. He was a leader of God's people who is used by Yahweh to fulfill promises that had been made a thousand years and more earlier. So it shouldn't be surprising to us, you know, a country's leader is a person just like its citizens, but more than anyone else, the actions of the leader impact the citizens. So it was with David though, and more, because David was a part of God's plan to rescue people from sin and all of its effects, the plan that he began to promise in Genesis 3.15, Genesis 49.10, and other passages, okay? As we come to the story of David and Goliath with the larger biblical story and context in view, our perspective on the story is completely transformed. David was more than just like us. He was special. In fact, okay, get this, okay? It is hugely important to remember that David was anointed as king, 1 Samuel 16, before he defeated Goliath, 1 Samuel 17. In meeting David, we don't merely encounter a person like us who learns to face a giant with God's help. We meet a man whom God had anointed as the long-awaited king who faced the giant with God's help and to won a, who, who won a victory that set his people free. We're going to notice how his victory impacts us more directly in the next section. But for now, let's focus on how this story connects to Jesus and the good news. Okay. As we read the story of David and Goliath in light of the grand story of the Bible, we discover that the life of God's Messiah King, who won the great victory for his people, reminds us most of Jesus. When I say Messiah King, Messiah, Mashiach, is the Hebrew word for anointed. So David was anointed as king. And when we call Jesus the Messiah, he is simply the anointed one. He's been anointed for God's purpose, okay? So the life of David was a sort of mini fulfillment of God's promises that leads us to expect the greater, the ultimate Messiah King Jesus, who was born in the lineage of Judah and David, okay? Sidebar here, have you ever wondered why the New Testament begins with a genealogy? I remember as a as a new pastor, you know, I became a past a senior pastor at age 27 and, uh, you know, it started late January um, and then I had 11 months and Christmas is coming, right? And it's my first ever Christmas series. I thought, I've got this brilliant idea. I'll just preach through the first couple of chapters of Matthew. And so I sat down first message in December um, that year as a new pastor, and uh, I opened it and I said, oh no, I forgot. It begins with a genealogy. What should I do? And in that moment in my study, I realized I have a choice. I can either skip it, and then I'm modeling for my people that genealogies aren't important, they're kind of like the chaff that the wind blows away. Or I could do the hard work of figuring out how to preach it. And if I do the hard work of figuring out how to preach it and it goes down like a lead balloon, I've modeled for my people, genealogies aren't important. And our new pastor is young and stubborn. But if I figure out how to preach this passage according to the grand story of the Bible, then um, it sings. The reason Matthew 1 verses 1 to 17 is a genealogy to begin the entire New Testament is to connect Jesus to the lineage of Judah and David. 
Jesus is the ultimate savior promised in Genesis 3.15, Genesis 49.10, 1 Samuel 2 verse 10, and many other Old Testament passages. Those are just the ones we've looked at. Okay, Jesus is the one foreshadowed by the life of David. Jesus is the new and better David. He is the greater son of David to come. So think of think of the Gospels. Have you, do you remember, you think of reading the Gospels and do you remember any scenes where someone says something like this, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Why son of David? Well, according to our reading, when we read the, the story so far, the fact that Jesus is in the lineage of David is quite important, isn't it? Okay. And we have we didn't even look at 2 Samuel 7. That's later in the passage. That's later in the Old Testament. Um, but that makes clear that that leads to Jesus. But that's for another day. Okay. So if Jesus fulfills the Old Testament hope, our first instinct when we read and apply the Old Testament is to not think first, how does this directly apply to me? We want to apply it to ourselves. Paul says all scripture is breathed out by God. And when he says scripture, he's meaning the Old Testament. All scripture is breathed out by God, useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man or woman of God may be equipped, or may be complete, equipped for every good work. Okay, so according to the Apostle Paul, the entire Old Testament is massively practical. But before we kind of draw a line from the Old Testament to our lives, what I what I'm arguing here is that we need to ask another question first. We need to ask this question. How was this passage fulfilled by Jesus? Okay. After we think through how this Old Testament passage was fulfilled by Jesus, we can then apply the passage to our own lives in a gospel centered way. Okay. So how was the story of David and Goliath fulfilled by Jesus? Well, David was a man God chose and anointed as king. Jesus was the son of God who would be the ultimate anointed Messiah, prophet, priest, and king. As prophet, Jesus would speak God's words. As priest, he would mediate between God and sinful people. And as king, he would be the head over God's people. David was a great man who would later sin. Jesus would be the perfect savior who would be tempted, but who would never sin. Hebrews 4 verse 15. David won a great victory that led to physical deliverance from a great enemy. Jesus would die on the cross as the king of the Jews. Matthew 27, 11, 29, and 37. And in the death of Jesus, he would bear the wrath of God that his sinful people deserved. Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 6. As King Jesus died, he defeated sin and all of its effects so that all who would turn from their sin and trust him would be set free. I just praise God. David points us to Jesus, David's office as anointed king, his life, his great victory over the enemy who was out to obliterate God's people, all point to the ultimate, the greater royal deliverer who would win the spiritual victory that would liberate a people from an eternity under the power of sin and death and hell. Amen? Well, fourth and finally, living in light of our Savior's victory. Living in light of our Savior's victory. If the story of David and Goliath is not meant primarily to inspire us to face difficulties with God's help, just like David did, but to point us to Jesus, the one who was the ultimate Messiah King, who won the ultimate victory over sin, death, and hell for all, for us, for all who would turn from their sin and trust him. Okay, does this story help us in the struggles we face every day? The answer is yes. In fact, when we read the individual story of David and Goliath in light of the grand story of the Bible, we find deeper and more practical personal relevance than we might have ever imagined.
So as we look again at the story of David and Goliath, we find that the victory of David did impact God's people more broadly. In fact, David before David stepped onto the scene, Saul, the ungodly failure king, and the warriors of Israel were on a mountain living in tents while the enemy taunted and threatened to obliter obliterate them. The lives of these people were then completely transformed by the victory of David. David's victory then impacted the people who would be under his reign. In light of David's victory, the enemy army turned and ran, and in the strength of King David's victory, the army of Israel chased and routed the defeated foe. So the people of Israel in general were helpless to do this before David defeated the enemy, and then after David's victory, they were e able to live in light of it and even win small victories along the way, victories that were won in light of our of their king's work. Okay, what's the difference? Okay, get this. Before David defeated Goliath, the people were fighting for victory. After David defeated Goliath, the people were fighting from victory. Before David defeated Goliath, the people were fighting for victory. After David defeated Goliath, the people were fighting from victory. They're fighting from a position of the victory has been won. I got that turn of phrase by uh, from, I think, H.B. Charles Jr., a friend of mine, passed that on to me. I think that's great. I give full credit to someone else who came up with a good turn of phrase. Okay, the story of David and Goliath is first a foretaste of a less, a kind of a lesser picture of the gospel. And this story focuses us us in on one incredible aspect of the gospel, the victory of King Jesus for us. In fact, the story of David and Goliath ultimately teaches us to live in light of the greatest victory the world has ever seen. In weakness on the cross, Jesus died under the wrath of God, which we deserved. And on the third day, he rose from the dead, conquering sin and death and hell for us. If David is more than just like us, then the people we can relate to most in this story is the people of Israel in general, because they lived in light of the victory that had been won for them. Just like we live in the light of the victory of Jesus that's been won for them. So after we recognize that our ultimate problem is not an opposing sports team or a broken down minivan or even a terrifying health diagnosis, I think that would be to minimize it would be to minimize the gospel by making those things the giants in our lives, right? Those are important, but the, our ultimate problem is our separation from God because of our sin. And when we recognize that, we can recognize, second, that the victory of Jesus for us was greater still than the victory of David. David was weak, but in God's strength, he won the victory for the people as a whole. But Jesus isn't weak. He's God the Son. It's through him the world was made. John 1 verse 3. He existed in the beginning because he never had a beginning. John 1 verse 2. And he holds the world together through his powerful word. Colossians 1 17. Jesus today, right now, holds the whole world together. But God the Son chose to become weak for us. He chose to humble himself. He chose to be born as a baby in a barn. He, he, was, pla he was placed in a feeding trough for animals, Luke 2, verse 7. He chose to experience hunger, John 4, verse 7 and 8. He chose to experience fatigue, John 4, verse 6. He chose to experience brokenheartedness, John 11, verse 35. Shortest verse in the Bible, folks. Jesus wept. He chose to experience betrayal, Luke 22, verses 47 to 48. He chose to experience shame, Hebrews 12, verse 2. And he chose to experience death, Philippians 2, verse 8. In the light of Genesis 3.15, we can say, that he chose to die so he could defeat the ultimate enemy for us.
through the weakness and death that Jesus chose, he lived the perfect life that we failed to live. He died the death under God's wrath that we deserve to die. And he won this victory for us. Again, that's a Tim Keller. He lived the perfect life we failed to live. He died the death that we deserve to die. Give credit to Keller, but what a what a great little summary, right? Okay, what about our giant challenges in life then? The David and Goliath story not only points us to our deepest ultimate need, and that's to have the victory over our sin and death and hell won for us because we can't make ourselves right with God. But Jesus stepped off the throne and bore the wrath of God that our sins deserved so that we could be reconciled to God. So our ultimate need has been met. But the story of David and Goliath also points us to the way Yahweh God calls his people, those who have turned from their sin, trust Christ as Savior, to respond to the challenges in the midst of the nitty gritty of life. So one response is simply this. We need to remember that Goliath is not our broken down minivan, okay? I think that's a first little application direct to our lives. Um, take it from me, Goliath is not your broken down minivan. In, re in reality, Goliath was a deadly warrior who sought to slaughter the people of God, okay? So compare Goliath not to your broken down minivan, compare Goliath to Satan, whose work did Jesus defeated on the cross. And Satan's not out to skin your knee. He's out to keep us from God's grace and to have us spend eternity in hell. In other words, this lesson is the problems of life's nitty gritty pale in comparison to the ultimate problem we have. When we live in light of our Savior's victory and when we see that we can't contribute toward our right standing with God because Christ purchased it for us, the nitty gritty details of our lives are impacted though, because we recognize that God cares about the broken down minivan, financial struggles, terrifying health diagnosis, maybe not the opposing sports team, but that's for another day, okay? He cares for these things, though, in relation to the ultimate thing. He's going to work all things for the ultimate good of his people, Romans 8, 28 so that they are gonna to persevere to the day of Christ and shine his character to a watching world. Sometimes this will mean that he will also give us victories over challenges in the midst of the nitty gritty. For example, Acts 5, 17 to 20. And sometimes this will mean that he will allow those challenges to remain. Job 1 and 2, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 9. So sometimes in the midst of the nitty gritty of life, in relation to the ultimate thing, financial hardship comes and God graciously delivers us. Sometimes financial hardship comes and God graciously allows it to remain. But when we trust Christ as our savior, nothing can snatch us from his hand. We can live every day in light of the victory of our Savior as we anticipate the eternal experience of our reward in its fullness. Romans 16, verse 20. So praise God that in Christ, we don't fight for victory, we fight from victory, the victory that he won for us. One last word. Notice again how the people in general were impacted by the victory of David over Goliath for them. In the strength of that victory, they rushed and routed the defeated foe. So it's kind of a picture of what theologians in history have called the church militant, or to put it in another way, this is a picture of Christians all over the world stepping out boldly for Jesus in the midst of opposition. Why? Because the greatest victory imaginable has been won for them by Jesus. Our eternity is secure. Our everyday life is lived under the approving smile of God because we've been reconciled to God in Christ. And we can indeed face challenges in life in light of this. 
But after we've seen these things in light of the grand story of the Bible, in light of the gospel, do you see how the call to face challenges in your life is so much more than a pep talk? It's so much more than saying, um, I'm going to face this challenge and then with God's help. No, interpreting this as David Goliath in the gospel means that this is not merely a story about you facing your giants with God's help. It's a story in which the promised anointed one over God's people won the victory for God's people. And so those same people could step out and live in light of their Savior's victory as they rushed and routed the defeated foe. See, if the victory of Jesus for you and I was immeasurably greater than the victory of Jesus, uh, the victory of David, then the stepping out in confidence in the midst of challenges can be immeasurably greater than the Israelite army who rushed and routed the defeated foe. So this is not a promise that every detail of our lives will turn out rosy. But it is a promise that in light of Christ, for all who have turned from their sin, trusted Christ and follow Christ, the ultimate victory has been won for them. They live every day with sure hope and therefore... And we can even say, like David, we can step out and face challenges. Not kind of a, with God's help as best supporting actor, but just, just covered in, immersed in gospel hope that's been, that's been pointed to in light of this story. Okay, well, that's the lecture. And what I've just modeled here is a Christ-centered reading of the Old Testament. Um, this is the kind of thing I teach in all my classes. Um, if I, if people ask me, how do you summarize God's calling on your life? I say, I say just this to exalt Christ from the old Testament. Okay. To exalt Christ from the old Testament. And in order to, to, to do that, in order to exalt Christ from the old Testament, um, as professor of old Testament and Hebrew, it's my calling to constantly draw lines from the old Testament to Christ and application to the Christian life. Do you see the order? From the Old Testament to Christ and application to the Christian life. I like to put it like this. Imagine the image of two funnels. And you know how a funnel has a wide end and a skinny end? Well, imagine um, imagine the wide end of the funnels up here and it goes down to the skinny end. Well, this is the Old Testament and it goes down and points to the skinny end, which is Christ. Everything points to the person and work of Jesus Christ. And imagine that another, a second funnel is put and the skinny end is, is matched up to the other skinny end. So we've got wide end, skinny end, skinny end, and then wide again. Well, before we get from the Old Testament way up here, the wide end to me way down here, we've got to go through Jesus. We've got to go to the skinny end and then out. Okay, so what I model in my classes and I, I teach you know, in my introductory class, it's a, a lot more introductory. It's it's made for people who don't have a background in biblical studies necessarily, and then we build as time goes on. But I I tend to um, equip with tools to legitimately move from the Old Testament to Christ and Christian application. So we could say so much more about that. The theory behind that, I'm going to cut it off there for now. What I've done here is modeled for you the kind of things that I hope. Um, people are learning to do at Heritage. So I can take some time now and answer some questions. Um, I'm going to click now on the question and answer tab and the uh, the admin team um, has been, um, I think, um, oh, there's Q&A. I got a couple questions here that I can, um, that I can uh, address. And I'll also mention um, if, um, if you want any more information about Heritage, again, admissions at heritagecs.edu, um, and you can email that way. Okay, so feel free to stick around for a few questions here. Um, first thing I'll mention is that a recording of this lecture will be available afterwards. So, so I'm getting some feedback, Russ. Is that, um, I don't know if that's normal, but anyway. A, a recording of this lecture is going to be available afterwards. So um, you can email 
um, the people that got in touch with you about this or an email admissions and ask, can I get a recording of this lecture too? Okay. Um, uh, Romans 8.32, someone wanted that. And uh, so here's a question. This is slightly off topic, but what I find interesting is that a lot of the issues that happen with the Hebrews' performance is their disobedience of God, particularly with regard to God's order not to take war plunder. It's one of the main reasons why God denounced Saul. The reason I bring this up is because until recently, war plunder was basically the norm. The armies of today, at least the Canadian army, are not allowed to take war plunder, though they are allowed to accept gifts sometimes. I find it to be an interesting connection to biblical times. Um, that's not really a question, it's a comment. Um, but what I'm gonna uh, just say to that, I think we gotta be really careful when we kind of say, just like Israel, so today. I think we gotta, um, I'm not saying no to this, I'm just saying, whenever we move from Israel to a nation today, we got to think in terms of Israel's, Israel was different. They were a theocracy. Um, God had, they're God's covenant people and they lived with God dwelling in their midst and they were governed by God's laws. Like the constitution of the country was the Torah. Um, the first five books of the Old Testament, we don't have that in Canada today. Um, so I just kind of mentioned that as a as as something. Okay, what would what would be a good book that gives an introduction to the Old Testament? Oh, okay. So here's my list. Okay, um, the the book that I have recommended and used um, that has that you know church people who are maybe familiar a little bit with the Bible, but don't have you know, formal education in anything, let alone Bible, but they were able to understand it. It's called God's Big Picture, um, and it's by Vaughn, I think it's Tracing the Storyline of the Bible is the subtitle, but it's by Vaughn Roberts, V-A-U-G-H-A-N Roberts, and he is uh, an Anglican priest in Oxford, England, I believe, and he was summarizing the work of Sidney Gray Donis. So God's big picture is tracing the storyline of the Bible. I know lots of churches use it in small groups. I've used it in small groups. And that's a book, it's basically saying this, you know, if, if you've been a Christian for longer than six months and someone has to ask you, what's the big picture story of the Bible? And you're not sure how to answer, well, we ought to be able to how to answer. So here's some simple ways. And what he does in that book is he says something like this, um, the kingdom of God is the major theme of the Bible. And um, how do we define the kingdom of God? It's God's people in God's place under God's rule and blessing. And so what Von Roberts does, following the work of Sidney Gradonis, simplifying it, is saying, okay, and look at all the different epochs in the biblical storyline and say, okay, at Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, who are God's people? Adam and Eve. Um, where is God's place? The Garden of Eden. Um, under God's rule, you shall not eat or you shall eat from and blessing. Okay. Um, and then all the way down, you can you can look at it, the different times in history. Who's God's people? Abraham. Where's God's place? Canaan. Uh, what's God's what's God's rule look like? Well, it's his word directly spoken to Abram and uh, and his blessing is on Abram's life and all the way down through all the periods in history. And then you get to the gospels. Who are God's people? Well, Jesus. Where's God's place? Jesus. How is God's rule expressed? Jesus, his word. Um, and how's this blessing come through Jesus? Why is Jesus God's place? What does Jesus say in John two? Tear down this temple and in three days I'll raise it again. But he was talking about the temple of his body. What's the point of the temple in the Old Testament? God is dwelling with his people. How's that expressed in the gospel? Jesus is God dwelling with his people. Okay. And then the, and then the Acts and, and following. Who are God's people? Anyone who's in Christ, Jew or Gentile. Where is God's place? Well, it's around the globe. Um, Jesus doesn't say, you know, go go to all the nations and bring them to Jerusalem because that's where you can be close to God. He says, no, go out from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth, preach the gospel, make disciples of all nations, 
and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and behold, you know the rest? I will be with you always to the end of the age. In other words, you don't have to be near the temple in Jerusalem to be near God. You need to, what does Jesus say in another place? Where two or three are gathered, there I am in their midst. You can be in Canada, which is a whole far away from Jerusalem, and be closer to God as you meet with brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay, that was a long answer. So God's Big Picture by Vaughn Roberts. I would also recommend, um, what else am I going to say? I could say so much here. Oh, Dominion and Dynasty by Stephen G. Dempster. Um, Dominion and Dynasty, it's a, a silver book, part of the New Studies in Biblical Theology series. And if you've you know, been a Christian for a few years, a little more familiar with the Bible, that's the next one I go to. It's just a simply an excellent book. And it's, I think it's about 250 or so pages, not too thick. And he's tracing the whole story of the Old Testament through this lens of dominion and dynasty. So um, super, super important um, book, super helpful. I could say a whole lot more. The Crossway has a biblical theological introduction to the Old Testament promises made, edited by Miles Van Pelt. That's a fatter book, and that's um, a little bit more of a seminary textbook type thing. And that's walking through every single individual book of the Bible. And it's different uh, professors from Reformed Theological Seminary are writing all the chapters. Uh, the last one I'll mention is um, Jason DeRoshi edited um, uh, what the Old Testament authors really cared about, a survey of Jesus' Bible uh, put out by Kriegel, the publisher. And again, an edited volume, different authors wrote different chapters on each of the books of the Bible. So that would be, I would put that at, you know, Bible college or seminary. I'd put the biblical theological introduction as more seminary. Dempster, any of those people could read it. Um, thinking lay people could read that, uh, any of these really. And then uh, God's big picture, anyone in your church could read and understand. Okay. Um, thank you for the lecture. Uh, no, I, I, Malcolm Gladwell. Have I read Malcolm Gladwell on David and Goliath? Um, I can't bring myself to read it. Sorry. <laughs> I just, it's my nighttime reading has to be kind of fun and light and just to kind of wind me down right before bed. And I, it just would feel like work that I'd be critiquing it the whole time. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure there's some, I've heard little tidbits and I've actually heard some helpful things, but I've heard enough that uh, I'm not with them. So, <laughs> okay. Thanks, Dr. Valancourt, lecture. Greatest. Uh, in light of biblical theology, how do we balance well a proper interpretation of the text with the greater context of the Bible? Is there ever a danger of taking it too far? Uh, of course there is, and you want the text to speak, right? So the goal is not to have other parts of the Bible kind of mute the one you're looking at. And what I've sought to model here is that the more we understand the whole big picture of the Bible, so you start with your Vaughn Roberts, you go into your Stephen Dempster and your Van Pelt and your DeRoshi and your different things, what those what those authors and Graham Goldsworthy um, yeah, this kind of stuff, Sidney Gray Donis. But what, what those authors are seeking, what, what those authors are doing a really good job of, and the more you read them is you're, you're, you're developing a big picture understanding. Jim Hamilton at Southern Seminary, uh, a big picture understanding of the whole Bible. And that's going to help, help you read individual passages in light of the whole thing. And so that's massively important and that it's like a new set of glasses through which to view things. So I don't think our problem is usually understanding passages overdoing in light of the whole. I think our problem, especially in the Old Testament, especially as evangelicals, um, the Old Testament is kind of foreign territory to us and it ought not to be. You know, I've had so many people, I've had so many people say to me, why would you do a PhD in Old Testament? And I always say something like, because people ask questions like that, you know, because people are asking, why would anyone do that? And well, because Jesus, <laughs> because Paul says, you know, it's, it's practical for, it's it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, and righteousness. So the man or woman of God and all that stuff, right? Second Timothy 3, uh, I think it's 15, 16 or 16 and 17. Um, so, okay, 
there is a danger of taking it too far. I don't think that's the common danger, um, but there's an art. Um, I think D.A. Carson, different people talk about uh, a bit of an order. You've got exegesis, which is pulling meaning out of an individual text. You've got biblical theology is understanding that text in light of the whole. And you got systematic theology. You're, you're asking, that's kind of the climax of it all. You have to do the first two before you can do systematic theology well. It's, it's asking questions of the text and what does the Bible teach on this kind of thing. Um, in biblical theology, you're letting the Bible create its own categories in, in which you're, a, you're asking and answering. And in systematic theology, you're coming to the Bible with your burning question. And something like um, uh, abortion, what should a Christian say about abortion? Well, there's no abortion in the Bible, so there isn't. that's not a biblical theological category. So what we got to do then is systematic theology, and we got to understand the big picture of um, the value of human life. You know, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. And these are texts we look at, and then we say, okay, how does, how does the Bible by extension then apply to life? So anyway, we got to constantly be doing that. Um, what would you say is the role of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament? Um, again, um, well, what we would want to do in this situation is to um, to just notice where he appears. And so the very first place that he appears is in the second verse of the whole Bible, right? Um, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void. And the Ruach, the Spirit of God, was hovering over the surface of the waters. So in that situation, he was, uh, there's this image of that, that Hebrew verb for hover, hovering is also used in Deuteronomy um, for a hen incubating, hovering over, incubating its nest of chicks. So what was the Holy Spirit doing in that situation? He was probably incubating unformed creation in, in time for verse 3 where, and Elohim and God spoke. And God said, let there be light and so on and so forth. Um, and what, what you got to do then is just where does he appear and what does he do? Um, so he um, you know, comes upon people and this kind of thing. But then he leaves people in Saul and David can pray, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Um, uh, when we move to the New Testament, though, and you know, as the Bible storyline kind of progresses, more and more light is shed on um, st stuff like the Trinity and this kind of thing. And we read uh, passages in the New, the New Testament about the promise of the Holy Spirit. So it seems like the pr what, what believers in Jesus have today is so much more than any sort of Old Testament saint had um, in relation to the Spirit. The Spirit could come upon people. They, he could move them to prophecy in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, um, we will be temples. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. And that sounds all well and good in our evangelical circles. But when we actually understand the Old Testament, what was the temple? The temple was where God dwelled, was more most powerfully present. And that's you, believer. And so it's, it's, it's a lot more, but he is present. And so that's all I'll say off the top of my head there. Um, any other questions? I'm not seeing any more. So I think that is all of our time. Thank you so much. Oh, I, I was right on. We said an hour or so, and it's an hour and five minutes. So it's just a real privilege to, um, to teach you today here from, uh, I got my uh, lockdown hair going. I haven't had a haircut in three months. And, uh, and uh, it's just a real privilege to be able to uh, lecture for you here. And uh, feel free to fire any other questions. They can email me and and uh, or email admissions with any questions. Okay. God's blessings to you.